today we are having our special episode on IT and our guest is Dan Cohen, a journalist, a filmmaker, and who has worked with RT America based in Washington DC. And he has also been in Palestine and produced uh, like widely distributed video reports and print reports from a number of outlets like the Electronic Intifada, Mondo Vice, The Nation, Alternate, Middle East Eye, Gray Zone, Al Jazeera, English, and Vice News. He has also like, reported widely on IT. And so today we are having him here. Thanks a lot, Dan, for accepting this invitation. Uh, without further ado, we'll like go into the questions. So why is like the US wanting to invade Haiti when it already has control of the country through the core group? Well, first, uh, thank you very much for having me. It's great to be on. I'm a big fan of Orinoco Tribune. Um, so, so I appreciate the, the invitation um, and at particularly such a pressing time. The reason the US uh, wants to invade Haiti is to put down um, an armed revolutionary movement that really threatens the status quo that the U.S. seeks to maintain. This group is called the FRG9, the Revolutionary Forces of the G9 Family and Allies, and it's led by um, a former police officer turned revolutionary named Jimmy Cherizier. His nickname is Barbecue. Maybe you've seen that name around. And he's been heavily demonized um, in order to prepare kind of the the American and, and Haitian public uh, for this intervention. It's been a multi-year process. So um, it's it's just a total threat to U.S. interests and uh, the, the comprador bourgeoisie in Haiti that is totally allied to the United States. And so that's why we're seeing this push from Washington to uh, get boots on the ground in Haiti. Okay, so since you mentioned Sherry's here, and I, I know that I, I, you're right, I have seen this name, and it was the only name that was mentioned in that sanctions resolution that was put, like, that was passed in the United Nations Security Council. So, like, I was going to ask you that, uh, I have, I've read your work on IT Liberté and other places, so you say that he is not the monster that he is made out to be. So what is this, like, uh, G9, the G9 you mentioned, and then there is another, there are other gangs also. So what are these, like, what are these gangs, what is their relations with the powers that be in IT, and why is this person, Jimmy Sherry, here, so demonized? And the others are not. Right. That's that's a really important question. When you look at, as you said, the, the UN sanctions and US sanctions back in 2020 against Haitian so-called gang leaders, the only one that is ever mentioned, the only one that it's that's ever targeted is Jimmy Cherizier. None of the others, there, there are numerous criminal, what you could call gangs, criminal networks in Haiti. You could look at Izo, leader of the 15 Second Gang, um, notorious for kidnapping and extortion and murder. Um, you could look at Tila Pli, head of, or I'm sorry, um, um, you, you could look at Tila Pli, head of the Grand Ravine Gang, uh, which which carries out all kinds of kidnappings and crimes. You could look um, at T. Gabriel in Cite Soleil, head of the GPEP, which is uh, a criminal organization. You could look at the 400 Mauzo. Um, which is the most, the foremost kidnapping criminal outfit in Haiti. All of these organizations fight against Jimmy Cherizier and the G9. So the only thing, so it only it it, it we can draw from that analysis that Cherizier and the G9 are threats to these interests. Uh, two powerful interests um, to to the local oligarchs. Uh, um, there is a, an oligarch named Reginald Boulos, who's very close to the United States, who um, we know from WikiLeaks and Haiti Liberté that um, he was paying the Haitian National Police to act as a private as a private army. Um, he pays uh, the leader of the JPEP. Uh, so, you know, to carry out his interests to attack the G9. Um, and, and keep the country destabilized. None of those people are under are under U.S. or U.N. sanctions. And so what we can see is that Jimmy Cherizier is the only one targeted. He's the leader of the G9. G9 is a head uh, or the G9 is a collection of essentially neighborhood self-defense groups. 
and it emerged in 2020 um, basically in response to constant uh, criminal activity in poor neighborhoods in Port-au-Prince, the capital of Haiti. And um, it's basically united these neighborhoods against the bourgeoisie in order to have um, a, an armed revolution. And so that's the threat that it presents. And the United States has, has understood what the nature of the G9 and who Jimmy Cherizier is from the very beginning. They initiated a very comprehensive demonization and disinformation campaign um, even before the G9 had been established. Um, so th the reason is because they saw that in his neighborhood, he and his neighbors were organizing to provide social services, um, clean water, food, education, classes um, for, for you know, children. And so this kind of, you know, the people organizing themselves, the masses organizing themselves to improve their conditions was immediately recognized by the U.S. Embassy as a threat. And that kind of crystallized into the G9 and what we see today. I mean, that's that's very complicated. I, uh, I mean, I read about the JPEP. I did not know about the other gangs. I mean, I may have heard about them, but I don't know. And that's a big problem that uh, I did is just like as if it does not exist. It's invisibilized. So that is why, I mean, that is the reason for my next question. Like, what is the situation on the ground in Haiti at this moment uh, in the face of a very possible U.S. invasion. I mean, there are already, I think, U.S. and Canadian planes in the country and everything. Well, about eight weeks ago, the de facto prime minister of Haiti, Ariel Henry, who is backed by the United States, um, issued, he repealed fuel subsidies. He took away fuel subsidies that essentially kept the country going, that allowed people to get to work, to send their children to school. And overnight, the price of a gallon of fuel doubled and in some places more and this prompted this sparked huge protests that are ongoing to this day amid those protests the g9 said we're going to take control of the vero fuel terminal in port-au-prince this is where haiti receives about 70 percent of its fuel and cherizier's point was well we can use this to demand that ariel henry this u.s backed uh, de facto prime minister stepped down. And also, you know, there's been a lot of questions about this tactic um, of taking control of the fuel terminal. And so I see it as, um, well, none of that fuel was accessible for the masses. So suddenly prices double overnight. So who can afford that? Only the bourgeoisie, the, the most, the wealthiest tiny percentage of Haitians who live in mansions in the hills above the slums of Port-au-Prince. Only they could afford gas. Only they could afford this, this fuel uh, to enjoy their lives. The masses could not. And so basically by cutting off the supply, this the the fuel hikes were just, were not only opposed, the, the lack of fuel, the inability to access fuel became not only a problem for the, the masses of Haitians, but then for the bourgeoisie. So essentially it's, um, so you have that in the middle of massive protests and um, and barricades all over Port-au-Prince that they shut uh, the the country from from um, functioning, shutting down the state from functioning in order to pressure for uh, the resignation of Ariel Henry. And so the United States and its allies, instead of saying, "Well, there's a legitimate reason." Uh, you know, for this protest, we need to repeal, repeal these fuel hikes and look at the conditions where people are living in. Instead, they've said, oh, this is the result of gangs, this terrible gangster, Jimmy Cherizier, and we have to go uh, assassinate him. And so the U.S. has been um, looking for any ways, any way to use the United Nations to carry out um, a military operation along either alongside the Haitian National Police or essentially in place of the Haitian National Police to get us a, a uh, kind of covert strike force to to carry out a, um, a military operation. But um, that has not succeeded so far. So this about this thing that if the 
U.S. is um, like apart from the sanctions resolution, it also has another resolution, this very military intervention resolution, and like it has not yet uh, put it to a vote in the United Nations Security Council. But there seems to be like if it is put to vote, there may be a veto. Like there is a possibility that Russia or China may veto it. So what would the U.S. do in that case? Like if it gets vetoed, it won't get the uh, blessings of the UNSC. So what will it do at that time? Like what do you think? Right. So if this uh, resolution goes to a vote, then it is likely that Russia and or China would veto it, preventing um, UN so-called peacekeepers from once again de being deployed to Haiti. So the U.S. is aware of that and is has proposed essentially deputizing a U.N. member state to carry out a military operation. Um, Anthony Blinken, the U.S. Secretary of State, was recently in Ottawa talking to um, Justin Trudeau about getting uh, the Canadians to to carry out this military operation. They don't seem to be at least Blinken did not come away with an agreement. Um, so there's talk about uh, through the Organization of American States, but that seems to be failing also. The one avenue that there seems to be a battle inside is CARICOM. Um, and so the the Bahama has said that it would participate in a military uh, operation in Haiti. But there are other countries, I think St. Vincent and the Grenadines, that are uh, more staunchly anti-imperialist that would not participate and would oppose it. So there's a real kind of diplomatic battle happening inside CARICOM um, with kind of the you know, uh, imperial puppets versus the kind of, you know, independent states that that want to maintain their sovereignty and Haitian sovereignty. Um, so if all of this fails, the United States created, uh, passed a, a law, it created legislation in 2019 called the Global Fragility Act. And the Global Fr Fragility Act was basically for exact situations like this, where the United States wanted to seek a way to maintain its influence in so-called so-called fragile states um, in the event that it isn't able to kind of uh, um, push its agenda through multilateral institutions like the United Nations. And so um, the Global Fragility Act is a combination of USAID, State Department, and Pentagon operations heavily focused on military operations using what they call small footprint um, actions or small front footprint operations, which is essentially covert covert war. And so this um, is, I think, what the U.S., this is definitely what the U.S. wants to use. And in fact, there are several countries that the U.S. has listed as candidates, the first candidates where it would use the Global Fragility Act, Haiti being the very first one. So that's what we're seeing. And after that would come Libya, and then several other countries in uh, mostly in West Africa, um, Togo, Benin, Mozambique is listed as one of them. Um, so Haiti is, um, as it has often been throughout history, is the kind of test case for for U.S. empire. Yeah, uh, I, I I just recently looked through the Global Fragility Act, and I think uh, Papua New Guinea is also a candidate for the Global Fragility Act. Exactly. Most countries are in Africa, then there is IG, and then there is Papua New Guinea. I exactly. think so. So like, now I'll come to my final question, and this is also quite sort of speculative, so I just want your brief opinion that, you know, the last time, I mean, in like the last 10 years also like us us has de facto like ruled haiti through its uh, core group and everything so in 2010 it was the brazil that led that so called peacekeeping mission in haiti and then in that core group we know about like us we talk about france canada and brazil of course but i know that like i was reading through the constitution of the core group and i found that there is there were representatives from bolivia argentina ecuador and even from unasur so in this like in this sort of situation that these countries are at that time at least all were ruled by leftist governments unasur originated from the pink tide and like that and despite all this they were all like together working together with us imperialism in haiti and in this uh, regard uh, the, the black alliance for pieces dr jemima pierre said something that she said the leftism of the americas collapses at the door of haitian sovereignty so, like, why does this happen? Why do you think this happens every time in Haiti? 
I think Dr. Pierre makes an important point. Um, you know, we see just the election of of Lula da Silva in Brazil that just happened, and um, many progressives are are celebrating, and understandably so. I mean, the um, the the specter of another Bolsonaro term is is uh, quite terrifying. Um, so for Brazilians, I think that is definitely a win. But if you look at what Lula did in the 2004 occupation of Haiti, he he joined in with the Bush administration in sending these so-called peacekeepers that carried out horrific crimes against the Haitian masses. Um, and so, you know, the, these are this has to be looked at and examined when when Lula's record um, is talked about. These have to be taken into into account and consideration. Currently, Mexico is the co-pen holder on these um, resolutions with the United States calling for that passed uh, um, sanctions against Jimmy Cherizier and is also the co he's also Mexico is also the co-pen holder um, on the um, resolution that the U.S. is is drafting uh, calling for military action in Haiti. So we have to really ask why um, Mexico is participating in this. What do they think they are going to gain by essentially, you know, making a deal with the devil? Um, and so, you know, this is kind of the limits of of, you know, national politics is that, um, you know, AMLO or, or you know, um, Ebrard, his foreign minister, may think that there's something to be gained by this. But, you know, as and it's it's certainly um, kind of contradictory to the role that Mexico has played under the AMLO government. When you look at the fact that AMLO provided um, refuge to Evo Morales as he fled Bolivia after the 2019 coup. So um, there are a lot of contradictions here. And, and, you know, ultimately I think it, it, we do need to, to raise these, these points and, and, uh, and keep these, keep these, our principles and, and make these criticisms. And, you know, I think ultimately Haitians are going to liberate themselves um, and they're not going to be able to um, rely on on the international community as much as as much as the international you know community so called international community should be there. It really comes down to to you know Haitians once again uh, liberating themselves and completing the uh, the eighteen o four revolution. Thanks a lot, Dan, for this. This was important. I think that these questions really do, does need to be like do need to be asked because. Why is Mexico doing this, right? And it, like, AMLO basically actually saved Evo Morales' life, like sending the military plane and everything into Bolivia while the coup was happening. And they were like, they were shooting at the plane itself. So when a person does this, and then uh, that person, that same person is like going into Haiti with a um, military intervention, basically a country that had showed the path of uh, liberation to Latin America, we should say. So that's actually like, I don't know, tremendous, terrible, I don't know what to say. So thanks a lot, Tan, for this conversation. I mean, I appreciate your time and uh, would like to like have you again and because uh, we don't like want to, want this thing to remain in silence and like remain invisible while like the US goes on invading Haiti once again. So like this is the nth time probably it's invading Haiti. So thanks a lot. Uh, just say where we can find your work so that we can all follow you and we'll like put them also in the, you know, our, uh, whenever we publish this thing. I have a new, I've founded a, well, first of all, thank you. And, and I appreciate your support. Um, and, and absolutely, we all have to um, keep an eye on, on Haiti and what exactly is happening there because it tends to be, um, a country that just doesn't get a lot of press, um, even in, you know, anti-imperialist media, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's can often be forgotten. So we all have to, to, um, fight that tendency. Um, my, as far as my work, you can find, um, on an outlet I've just founded called uncaptured media. Um, you can see on un uncaptured, uh, dot substack dot com. And I'm also very active on Twitter. You can find me at, at Dan Cohen 3000 and uh, see my, my latest investigations there. Okay, thank you very much. Thank and you. like, have a great day.